are here for the Quentin is Alive Q&A, and we've got a lot to get through, so let's get going. Before we start, there's actually an article about me and my channel over at Esquire.com, so I'd like to give a shout out to its author, John Marr. Journalism is a brutally difficult industry, so be sure to check out the article and share it if you can. Facebook it, glass candle it, Twitter it, wear with it, green dream it, grinder it, whatever. So the first question I got is, Drinkwater has got to be the absolute stupidest surname George R. Martin has come up with. Seriously. Drinkwater? Literally. What the fuck? Well, in my opinion, the stupidest surname that our author has come up with is Shet from the Vale. There's even a knight named Sir Other Shet. Hooray. Poo joke. It's like our author accidentally left in the placeholder name on that one. There is a theory that House Drinkwater is named after Sir Quentin Ball, the famous Blackfire supporter who died at the Battle of the Redgrass Field, when he stopped for a drink of water. It's hard to say, but we do know that the Ironwoods were huge Blackfire supporters and the Drinkwaters are vassals of the Ironwoods. Question number two. Could his quest simply be a riff mockery of the hero's journey? Well, I think there's actually two questions here. The first is, is our author referencing Joseph Campbell's hero's journey? And the second is, is Quentin's quest supposed to be a trope-breaking spin on a stereotypical hero's adventure? With regard to Campbell, no, probably not. There's a lot of essential aspects to the hero's journey, like a refusal to call, a mentor, or being tested that Quentin doesn't do. With regard to the second, yes, Quentin is a trope-breaking story, like almost every story is in A Song of Ice and Fire. But we aren't really sure in which way it breaks the trope. Having read nearly everything George R. R. Martin has ever written, I can say pretty soundly that our author is primarily focused on the horrors of war, and is specifically obsessed with Vietnam. The story of Quentin, in my opinion, is more about the dutiful son who goes off to war than it is about the knight who wants to marry the princess. Our author isn't just saying, ha ha, you were expecting the hero to win, but he fails. I fooled you. No, the Quentin story is about more. It's inundated start to finish with the specter of his friends dying and the horrors of Astapor. This trauma causes Quentin to double down on his duty, which causes even more tragedy. Keep in mind, this is what America did with Vietnam. After tens of thousands of Americans and millions of Vietnamese died, many people thought that we better stay in the war so that the original deaths weren't meaningless. In my opinion, the trope breaking of the Quentin story is not just that adventure turns up differently, it's that adventure is fundamentally rotten from the start. And the first line of the Merchantman chapter is, Adventure stank. And our third question is, But who is the Tattered Prince? An interesting question. Weirdly, the story of Tatters is that he used to be the Prince of Pentos, but the city routinely sacrifices its prince, so he was compelled to flee. It may be that Tatters wants to return to his position, but on his terms. We don't know much else on him. He's clearly a clever and ruthless man, and if he's been pining for Pentos this long, it makes him a bit like the Blackfires or Viserys or Danny, desiring rule after a lifetime of exile. However, Tatters only claimed he wanted Pentos. In the end, it seemed he planned on killing the dragons and double-crossing Quentin. So in actuality, he didn't want Pentos that much. He likely sold that dream for some extra gold from Yunkai. Tatters, in my opinion, is nobody. Just as his cloak makes him larger than life, his reputation does the same. But in the end, it's all image. And our fourth question. What do you think Quentin's future purpose is? Just to be the person responsible for releasing the dragons? or to permanently ride either Rhaegal or Viserion. Generally, I think Quentin's future is PTSD. Quentin is likely burned and disfigured, perhaps even looking like a frog. And I do wonder what happens when a broken boy returns from the war. Dragons also seem to be a metaphor for nuclear weapons, and the story of nukes is that of proliferation. I see almost no chance that the dragons will all stay in a single power's control. They will spread, they will battle each other, and they will cause death. I'm not certain Quentin will stay the mount of his dragon, I think it's almost certain one dragon will be captured by the Ironborn. That leaves only one dragon left. Many people predict Tyrion will be a dragon rider, but Quentin may stay the rider as well. I'd say it's a toss-up. Question number five. How's Danny gonna feel about all this? Oh, hey, Quentin, I see you're on my dragon, so now I'll marry you? Well, I don't see Danny coming back to Slaver's Bay for some time, and I imagine both her dragons and their riders will be gone by then. Quentin didn't really want Danny anyway. He wanted her dragons. So now he may have one, so there's no need for her anymore. Question number six. Whoa, whoa, wait, you said Quentin rode a dragon out, but I thought in your other videos you said only a Targaryen with a certain gene could ride dragons. Yeah, that's right, I don't think Quentin has special Targaryen genes, or as I said in the Genetics of Dragons and War series, the Dragon X gene. Instead, I think Quentin nettled the dragon. There was this girl named Nettles during the dance who rode this dragon sheep stealer by feeding the dragon a sheep 
waiting for it to become docile, and jumping on. She had no special genes. Keep in mind, besides being nukes, dragons also represent rule in a way, and Nettles was this dark-skinned, bastard-born female. I think it's likely our author was making a statement on the fall of rule based on blood and patriarchy and the rise of popular revolutions. In truth, you don't need to have the right blood to ride a dragon, or to rule a country. Quentin and the Ironborn stealing dragons are like popular revolutions usurping power from kings. In the Winds of Winter excerpts, could there be clues with regards to the dragons? The Barristan and Tyrion chapters? With the details of the battles and the fears and hopes of the dragons joining the battle to feast. Well, there are a couple interesting things in the sample chapters. There's a small thing in the Tyrion chapter where Tyrion notes that dead men and dragons move through the sky. Of course, he's talking about Yun Kai flinging diseased corpses, but I have heard some speculation that it has a double meaning for Quentin secretly being up there as well. I personally don't think there's much chance of this. Quentin is probably too busy recovering and has no dog in the fight between Yun Kai and Meereen. Now, it should be noted that in the Tyrion chapter, Viserion is eating bodies flung at him which is what he was used to in the Dragon Pit. Viserion does return to his lair mid-battle for some reason after feasting, so he should again be docile and ready to be ridden again. The Tyrion chapter also reveals that the Windblown have switched sides, so Arch and Drink have been successful in whatever they did. Now, as I noted before, Tatters didn't really want Pentos that much, so I don't see why Barristan's offer would work for him when it didn't work for Quentin and Barristan has little ability to deliver Pentos considering he lost his dragons. This makes me think that someone like Drink is dressed in a tattered cloak pretending to be the tattered prince, and this would echo Garland Tyrell being dressed up like Renly. An imposter is leading people in battle. Question number eight, so where is Quentin then? Is he in the pyramids with the dragons or somewhere else? Yeah, that's where I think he is. I think he's resting up there and waiting for his next move. Question number nine, but does Quaith not go over the sun's sun? Well, I believe all prophecy is bunk. I firmly believe that prophecy is largely meant to trick people into killing each other or themselves, which is the plot of several George R. R. Martin stories, including one called And Seven Times Never Kill Man. But let's put that aside and suppose prophecy were true. Why do you think Quentin is the son's son? Because Danny came to that conclusion? Because she also thought Resnak was the perfumed Seneschal. Son's son is also just so incredibly broad. Rago is a son's son, the Karstarks are a son's son, the Shrouded Lord is a son's son, Grayscale is a son's son, not to mention homonyms, a son's son like a grandson, or the second son's son. And is the son's son a person that's coming to Danny physically, or is Quaith talking about a vision at the House of the Undying? Not that I haven't done it, but this is generally why my videos don't mess with talking about prophecy or symbolism that involves overly general things like colors or animals. Question number 10. Couldn't the whole oil spreading and burning be that which killed him, though? It explains why it was a slower death. That's very true and certainly possible. It would make Quentin into even more of an absolute failure and would be weirdly fitting in a sad, sick way. I would still wonder about Drink feigning grief and all of Arch's lies, though. Question 11. If he's riding a dragon, that makes him one of the three dragon riders, correct? They only have one rider until the rider dies? Well, I think Danny has a telepathic bond with Drogon, and I think this is the reason why dragons can only have one rider at a time. However, I think Quentin nettled his dragon, so I don't think he has a telepathic bond with it. I suspect that someone could steal his dragon at any time. Do you think there's any chance the Martells have some telepathic ability themselves? They are a mix of First Men and Roinar, I guess, originally. Well, that's true, and on top of that, I do think there is some chance that Dornish Daenerys passed on some telepathy to House Martell. But whether they have abilities or not, we know that Sorella at least has access to a glass candle, which gives her telepathic abilities. However, House Martell is mostly Roinish, and we hear about some Roinish water magic, which seems to involve flooding a rival city and fogging up the city of Croyane. And the Roinar may have created Grayscale. But all of those have non-telepathic explanations. You can flood a city by opening a dam, and pipes can create fog, and Grayscale can be a bioweapon. So we don't really have anything that says that the Roinish have telepathy. Question 13. Are House Martell and House Ironwood on good terms now? I would say, hell no. But we will get to that in the deeper dawn. Question 14. What if, big if, Quentin's plotline is there for us to learn ultimately Daenerys will have an enemy in Dorne? After all, throughout early Targaryen conquest history, Dorne was the staunchest enemy of Aegon the Conqueror, whom, symbolically, Danny embodies. I think you're onto something very important here. There is fundamentally little reason for the Martells to like anything Targaryen, Blackfire, or Valyrian, 
except for maybe Aegon if he actually is the son of Elia. The Quentin quest, at its heart, is off, and we shall talk about this in the Deeper Dorn. Question number 15. What could Quentin's fate mean for the endgame of A Song of Ice and Fire? I know the show is the show and the books are the books, but Quentin is thus far absent from Game of Thrones. Well, on the most basic level, the plot of Ice and Fire is pretty straightforward. It's war sucks and everyone is going to keep dying until we're all dead or until we realize that war sucks. The Dornish are a bit special for me because it wasn't until meeting the Sand Snakes in A Feast for Crows that I put it all together. I remember reading and thinking, seriously, you guys want to fight for Myrcella to be queen? This is stupid. Aren't you guys all tired of this war? And then I said, oh, that's the whole fucking point. What I think is interesting about the Game of Thrones movement is that people have favorite houses and are rooting for characters to win in the end. Well, guess what? No one is going to win the Game of Thrones. To quote the movie War Games, the only way to win is not to play. Now, is Quentin needed for this? No, not really. No one specifically is needed. There's more than one way to skin a cat, and there's more than one way to commit mass genocide upon your characters until finally, finally everyone is dead, and you scream, I get it, war is bad! Question 16. Didn't he smile in the sense that his face was burned off and his teeth were visible? Like a skull's? Maybe that's it. Barristan certainly took it literally and said, how can you tell? He has no lips. Some people also bring up Tywin, who also smiled as a dead man, but Tywin had lips. It's a weird scene and it's hard to say what's going on in Miss Sandy's head. Maybe she's looking at micro muscles? Maybe she's joking? It's hard to say what's going on with her. She also weirdly says that Quentin's Dornish gods have taken him off, but Quentin follows the faith of the Seven and would be awaiting the stranger. And we have no reason to assume that Tatters or the Windblown would worship Mother Roin. In the end, I think it's a weird clue that this isn't Quentin, or some sort of muddled, ironic closure to the character of Quentin. Question 17. Wait, did Daenerys, sister to Daron II, have children with the Dornish Prince? If so, they might be ancestors to Quentin, and he could be a dragon rider? That is certainly Quentin's belief, but I personally don't think he ended up with any dragon riding genes from Dornish Daenerys. I think instead he nettled the dragon. With regard to the last of the Windblown, the only surviving one who was so terribly burned, why would Drank need to threaten him anymore with his sword? Wouldn't the burns have already sealed his fate? That's a good point, though he may falsely believe he has a chance at survival. A much more sinister possibility is that Arch and Drank held the captive by sword point, doused him in oil, and then burned him. This may seem overly evil for Arch and Drink, but let's keep in mind that Theon did almost the same thing. The only difference is, Theon killed his victims first. So, will we see Quentin die of infection in the next book, maybe? Well, that's certainly a possibility. We aren't sure how bad his burns are, but Quentin likely needs a maester and is stuck in Slaver's Bay during war with no help around. And the Blue Graces are AWOL. Question 20. If they succeeded in taming and riding a dragon, why keep it a secret? Well, I'm not sure what Arch and Drink would gain from telling Barristan. Say they say, Quentin rode out on a dragon. Well, then the Brazen Beasts would go looking for him at the pyramids and would likely find him resting up and arrest him. And then all three Dornishmen would share a cell. Question 21. In the Dornish Master Plan, you say the Windblown worked for Illyrio. After spending so much time trying to hatch dragons, why kill them? And also, don't Drink and Ironwoods want Quentin to fail? Are they now more loyal to him than their own families? Well, I'll touch on much of this in the Deeper Dorn, but let's start with Illyrio. Fundamentally, we know that Illyrio supports Aegon, and Aegon is the most important thing. And so we see Illyrio's plan shift based on what's best for Aegon. I personally don't think Illyrio ever was trying to hatch dragons. I think in a Game of Thrones, he was sending the Dothraki east in order to free up forces in the free cities. I also think he was trying to impress followers of the Red God to secure Volantis. After dragons hatched, he thought he could then use them. But then Danny became anti-slavery. At that point, she became a threat to Illyrio's way of life, and her dragons needed to die. Now, House Ironwood was a huge Blackfire supporter, so it stands to reason that they would be with Varys, Illyrio, and Aegon, who definitely have Blackfire support of the Golden Company, House Peak, and House Heddle. So yes, the Ironwoods should be trying to stop Quentin, and Drink especially seems to be a constant barrier to Quentin's success. But the big question is... What about now? Drink, Arch, and Quentin have been through hell together. It's really hard to say where Arch and Drink's loyalties now lie. If Quentin succeeded in stealing a dragon, he may have earned the loyalty and respect of Drink and Arch, in the same way that Danny earned the respect of Jorah. Who Arch and Drink support is something I'm really looking forward to in The Winds of Winter. And finally, question 22. 
Was taking a dragon Doran's plan all along? I certainly don't think so. We will get into this in the deeper Dorn, but House Ironwood and House Martell are not on good terms. The fact that Quentin was completely in the hands of Ironwoods implies that Doran had no intention of Quentin succeeding. Quentin was, in a sense, a distraction from the real Dornish master plan. And that's all for now. I'm sorry if I didn't get to your question. Once again, please check out and share the Esquire article, and I'll see you guys after the Game of Thrones premiere.